Hello, everyone, and good afternoon on at least where I am, this bright, uh, sunny, I'm trying to sit so you don't have to see the glare in my face, this bright, sunny Monday afternoon in September. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to have so many people uh, turn up for this session today. Uh, we've got well over 100 and continuing to grow. Um, people already have joined, um, which is, is really fantastic to have so many people join us for this first um, of three sessions on nutrition and prostate cancer. Um, and this is obviously a part, a webinar part of our Living Well with Prostate Cancer webinar series. For those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is David James and I'm the head of patient projects at Prostate Cancer Research. So just a quick introduction to who Prostate Cancer Research are. Uh, we are a medical research focused charity uh, and the, we're focused on the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of advanced prostate cancer and delivering better quality of life outcomes for patients. We're proud to fund 15 high quality, innovative projects right across the UK. And we have a shared aim of developing breakthrough treatments across all these projects so that one day we can live in a world where people are free from the impact of prostate cancer. So some of our most cutting edge projects include ones where our scientists are delving into a protein which should stop cancer from growing. And so their team is asking why it stops working about half of prostates, and if we can use that knowledge to essentially find a new off switch for cancer. Another team we are funding are looking at using our body's natural immune system to try to destroy prostate cancer. But we also have projects focused on existing treatments as well. And I'd like to just take a moment to tell you about one of these, which is focused on making radiotherapy more effective and with fewer side effects. So thanks to our wonderful supporters, PCR is funding Professor Bart Corneliuson and Dr. Tiffany Chan at the University of Oxford. And Bart and Tiffany are working to improve a new type of radiotherapy, which is designed to hunt out cancer even after it has spread and ensure that it benefits even more people with prostate cancer. They're working with a type of radiotherapy called lutein PSMA. Now, PSMA is a protein found almost exclusively on prostate cancer cells. So it can be used to actually guide the radiotherapy directly inside tumor cells. This means that we don't need to know where all the cancer cells are before treatment, as they'll be expressing PSMA. So some lutein PSMA treatments are already used in the UK, but on a private basis only. And at the moment, they're primarily used for pain relief. But the researchers aim to combine lutein PSMA with other therapies, and their initial results from testing nearly 2,000 drugs have led to the discovery of a group of drugs that may be able to help lutein PSMA hunt out prostate cancer better and make it more effective for patients. But beyond our research, we're also dedicated to educating, empowering, and supporting our patient, partner, family, and carer communities. And that's why we launched this webinar series, Living Well with Prostate Cancer, in collaboration with our good friends, Tackle Prostate Cancer, the UK's National Federation of Prostate Cancer Patient Support Groups. This series, which began last month and runs until January, will encompass a whole variety of topics that you've told us you want more support on. So now a couple of quick housekeeping points before we get started. Uh, for those of you who joined last month, I apologize that you have to hear these again, but this is a, a Zoom webinar rather than a, a Zoom meeting, which many of us are accustomed to. And so what that means is all attendees will automatically have their video and microphones muted. And the reason for this is we'll be recording this session and we'll be sharing this uh, with anyone who wasn't able to join us this afternoon. Um, the first uh, hour or so of this session will be a presentation by our speakers. And once that's complete, we're then going to open up to questions. And we've set aside approximately half an hour to answer as many of your questions as we can. So there's no chat function, but there is a Q&A option uh, on your screen. So if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to type them in, in there. And then we'll address as many of these as we can when we open up to Q&A. So I would like, like to now thank our speakers, Dr. Daniela Moe and Mrs. Linda Mallinson from Functional Medicine Wimbledon, who are leading the three sessions this month on nutrition and prostate cancer. Daniela and Linda, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, David. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting us today. Um, we are really delighted to be here and uh, to present the first of these three webinars. Um, that are uh, centered around uh, nutrition and prostate cancer. 
Um, and um, we are going to start today with uh, talking about the contributing factors to uh, prostate cancer and um, about nutrition and lifestyle interventions, which we know um, have um, some bearing on the management of prostate cancer. Uh, we are two functional medicine practitioners. We are, first and foremost, we are conventionally trained practitioners. I am a, an NHS GP, have been for over 20 years, and uh, Linda will uh, uh, introduce herself in a minute, a, a dietitian. Um, but in the latter years, we've also trained in um, functional medicine. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what that is, it's a, a, a type of medical approach where we look um, to uh, uncover the root causes of chronic disease. And uh, it's a type of approach that is very deeply rooted in um, nutritional and lifestyle interventions. Um, and so uh, I'm going to just ask Linda to introduce herself and then we'll get going. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Well, yes, I'm Linda, and I am a, um, a dietitian and been working uh, in sort of cancer care since 2003. And more recently, Daniela and I studied um, functional medicine together, and I think we um, yeah, got our certification in 2018 and have joined forces, and we work from a clinic in Wimbledon together. So we are delighted to, um, to be speaking to you in the next three weeks, and uh, we hope that you find this information helpful. And uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of each session. So sit back and enjoy. The next slide, please. So um, we are going to be presenting three webinars um, uh, on a weekly basis. And today in this first webinar, we're going to be looking at the evidence um, behind the contributors and risk factors in prostate cancer, and particularly the ones that we um, know uh, can be influenced by lifestyle and nutritional interventions. We'll take um, some time to um, talk about some hormonal um, considerations, some hormonal factors, and then we'll jump into the uh, a deep dive into the nutritional and lifestyle factors that are relevant to prostate cancer, in particular dietary approaches such as the Mediterranean diet, the low carb diet, the low fat diet. Um, and this is what we'll be talking about mostly today. Um, the uh, lifestyle factors we'll just touch on today, but we'll be expanding on more in the, um, in the last of the webinars. Next slide, please. In webinar two next week, we'll be focusing on nutritional support, specifically whilst undergoing treatment um, and in between treatment as well, um, in between bouts of treatment. And so we'll touch on principles of detoxification. And we'll also be um, talking about what useful supplements may help with some of the side effects of treatment. Next slide. Uh, finally, in our last uh, uh, webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the importance of gut health and uh, optimizing gut health. And as you will see as we go through the next uh, few weeks, uh, gut health is absolutely pivotal um, in uh, health generally and also specifically in, in cancer management. And linked to gut health are uh, brain health, bone health, and um, uh, it is uh, vital for supporting immunity, all things that are very relevant in prostate cancer. And uh, we'll be talking um, uh, more about diet and modifiable lifestyle factors to support health going forwards. Next slide, please. So what are our objectives? We would like uh, very much and hope to achieve that by the end of these three webinars, you should be able to understand the principles and importance of gut health, um, employ at least one new technique to help optimize gut health, we'll be presenting several, um, identify at least one key supplement that can potentially benefit your specific situation. Um, hopefully you'll be able to discuss your nutritional support in the context of treatment, um, learn and put into practice at least one change in your diet which will benefit your immune system. And finally, learn and put into practice at least one change in lifestyle. Next slide, please. So just uh, a little bit of introduction. Um, I'm sure you're all very much familiar with this. These are prostate cancer stats for this country. 
And uh, what we know is that one in six um, men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. And the rate is about 130 new cases a day, uh, at least uh, according to data uh, between 2015 and 2017. It is the most common cancer in men, and it accounts for 26% of all new cancers um, in men, at least in 2017. Um, we know that the incidence is increasing. However, um, the projections show that the mortality rates are decreasing and they are projected to fall by 16% uh, between, um, uh, uh, between 2014 and 2035. Next slide, please. This is just a reminder. Again, I'm sure nobody needs to be reminded of this, but these are the typical primary interventions for prostate cancer. So many people will have will start off with active surveillance. Um, this is where um, there is monitoring um, of PSA levels of various uh, biomarkers in blood. Um, uh, there'll be scans and there'll be a routine examination. So this is just active surveillance. But a lot of uh, people will undergo surgical treatment, whether partial or uh, radical. Um, uh, many uh, patients will have hormonal therapy, depending on um, the particulars of their um, situation, and you'll probably be aware with andro androgen deprivation therapy. Um, there is, of course, radiation, uh, especially for advanced disease, sometimes also for earlier disease, and, for, and chemotherapy. So these, I'm sure you are familiar with. What we are going to be um, focusing on is not so much this side of things, but how um, the nutritional and lifestyle interventions fit in to this management. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is where we get into the evidence of um, what may be the contributors and risk factors in prostate cancer, where specifically where nutrition and lifestyle interventions may be of help. So you'll see that, um, uh, in the various columns, um, there are various uh, risk factors that have been shown in the literature to be relevant in prostate cancer. What I've done here is I've highlighted in green the ones that where we know that um, nutritional approaches and lifestyle um, interventions have the most direct effect. So um, we know that you know, avoidance of smoking, of sort of heavy intake of alcohol, um, the increase of exercise and the management of stress have um, a direct effect on um, um, the management of prostate cancer. Um, and also very crucially, um, management of weight of nutritional states and the management of blood sugar regulation um, is, is really crucial. So we can intervene on this uh, with uh, dietary approaches. In purple, I've highlighted those things that um, where we have um, uh, the opportunity to intervene with lifestyle and with nutritional interventions, where there is perhaps some indirect um, um, uh, advantage to um, uh, applying these kinds of uh, strategies. Um, you'll see that um, there is some uh, genetic, um, there are some genetic fa risk factors for, uh, for prostate cancer. And this is interesting because um, as we see in the next slide, please, um, what happens is um, our genes are not static things. We used to think decades ago that genes were, you know, very static. If you had certain types of genes, that was it. That was sort of your destiny in a sense. What we what we now know, what we've learned in recent times, is that um, the, our genes are a bit like our blueprint. But um, whether they the genes get um, uh, to express um, their um, the, the, the blueprint itself depends on our environment. It's a bit like the difference between hardware and software. So if we have these genes, they can be expressed if we are in, um, uh, for example, exposed to certain types of nutrition, exposed to certain toxins, um, nutrition, lifestyle, toxic exposures and social interaction determine, make our environment and our environment influences the way in which our genes are expressed. 
That is why when we um, uh, intervene with lifestyle and nutritional approaches, we have some degree of control over what may happen in the future. Next slide, please. So hormonal considerations, um, you're probably aware of the fact uh, that uh, there are some hormones that are very um, important in the um, appearance of prostate cancer. The ones that are most typically um, implicated are testosterone. So this is the primary male hormone. And we know that men uh, whose total testosterone is, is the highest is, um, uh, are more likely to develop prostate cancer. And this is the rationale um, by which um, anti-androgen therapy is used. So high testosterone may uh, bring to um, uh, uh, prostate cancer. So some of the therapy is aimed at reducing those levels of testosterone. Another really, really crucial uh, hormone um, is this one called IGF-1, uh, insulin growth factor one. Um, this hormone alongside insulin, they're essentially the growth hormones. What does that mean? It means that they promote growth of tissues and they are found to be particularly high in many cancers, including prostate cancer. Uh, and why is this relevant for us? Because um, we know that if we intervene with uh, certain dietary approaches, we are, and we are able to reduce these levels of insulin and insulin growth factor, then uh, we may be able to um, manage the cancer better. Uh, we may be able to slow its progression. Um, and how do we do this? We'll do, we do this by um, introducing dietary uh, interventions that are aimed at reducing um, a blood sugar uh, load, um, tissue uh, sugar. Um, and so we do this with uh, low glycemic diets, for example. But there are other uh, types of interventions, such as avoiding dairy, for example, and lifestyle interventions, such as exercise, that are also known to reduce this particular uh, hormone. So one to remember, and one which we'll, we will be referring to as we progress in this webinar. And another one to remember is estrogen. Um, estrogen is not just important for women, it's important for men as well. It's involved in uh, the wider um, hormonal regulation, and it's specifically relevant to uh, bone health and brain health. Um, but it's also relevant to tissue growth again. So along the same lines, as I just mentioned for insulin growth factor one, there are some dietary interventions where we know that there is some modulation of estrogen. And these dietary interventions may include things like soy foods and, and phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens means plant-based estrogens. Um, and, the, and we think it's because these types of estrogens bind to the safer estrogen receptors which then inhibit uh, tissue growth. So these three hormones in particular are the ones that we are most interested in. Next slide, please. So what do we do? What are we going to be talking about today? Um, we've uh, touched on the current evidence around the, the um, uh, contributing factors to the emergence of prostate cancer. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at specific dietary approaches, and in particular, the Mediterranean diet and the ketogenic diet. We will look at some uh, useful supplements that may be of help, and we'll also be touching on the lifestyle strategies, which we will then expand on in greater detail in the third talk. Next slide, please. So um, going into the evidence, there is a huge amount of um, research and data out there that tell us that nutrition and lifestyle can help in these specific situations. They help with age-specific factors, hormonal factors, our general nutritional states, the management of weight, pain management, emotional and mental health. And we also know that nutrition and lifestyle interventions may help with cancer progression. So there is data to back all of these um, very important factors, um, which we will be addressing. Next slide, please. Um, so the current evidence tells us in terms of dietary approaches, 
that if we minimize simple carbohydrates, that's to say simple sugars, what happens is we reduce insulin. And insulin is one of those hormones that we mentioned before that promote growth. So if we reduce insulin through caloric restriction or through a low glycemic diet, a low sugar diet, that means that we um, are reducing some of those risk factors um, for progression of cancer or indeed initiation of cancer. There is evidence for Mediterranean diet, for the ketogenic diet, and also some evidence around um, the beneficial effects of fasting, and we'll be touching on that as well. Um, the lifestyle strategies are uh, around uh, the benefits of exercise, the avoidance of toxins, around stress management, and indeed around sleep hygiene, which is also extremely important. Um, one thing I um, must say, of course, is that um, None of these interventions are meant to be substitutes for your other conventional um, interventions. These are there to support your conventional interventions. Next slide, please. So one of the most striking bits of evidence that we have is that um, uh, weight gain is associated with um, a higher rate of progression to higher grade prostate cancer. So an elevated body mass index, which is the way in which we, it's a crude measure really of um, weight, if you like, um, uh, in relation to our height. Um, when the higher the body mass index, uh, the, the greater the progression to high prost, uh, grade prostate cancer. Why is that? Um, first and foremost, we must remember that fat tissue uh, which we also call adipose tissue, is not idle, it's not inert, it's not sitting there doing nothing. It's a massive repository for what we call inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines are uh, inflammatory proteins that are released in certain situations and are then circulated um, around the body and they can wreak havoc. Um, when this happens, um, immunity is affected, often impaired, and, and by um, in turn, or so is the body's uh, tumor surveillance system. So that's why we want less adipose tissue. We want fewer fat cells um, because we don't want as many cytokines to be released into the system. Um, also, we know that excess body fats increases the resistance to that insulin, that hormone that regulates sugar. And we've already learned that um, that is associated with um, more aggressive uh, prostate cancer. We know essentially that um, if we increase, for every five units of body mass index that we increase, um, there is a 21% increased risk of biochemical recurrence of um, prostate cancer and a 15% increased risk of death from prostate cancer. So we really want to, that body mass index to be normal, which is lower than 25. So we're going to take a minute now to launch a poll. So over to uh, David. We're going to take a few minutes to, for you to, um, to uh, fill out this poll for, for us and then we'll, we'll continue. All right, we'll have about 10 more seconds and then we'll close this poll. 
Uh, we've got some great responses thus far, but just want to keep it open. Squeeze a couple more out. They're coming in thick and fast. Wonderful. Okay, and I'm closing the poll in three. I apologize to anyone who didn't, hasn't managed to submit it. Three, two, one. Okay, and I'm sharing the results now with you. Can you see those results? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Right, over to you, Linda. Thank you. All right. David, can we go into slide 17? Thank you. Okay, so one of our main priorities when it comes to dietary approaches is to remove all refined carbohydrates and sugars out of the diet. And the reason why we would like to do this is because we know that um, refined carbohydrates and sugars stimulate the production of insulin, and um, this can create insulin resistance. And raised insulin causes the liver to convert any excess glucose or carbs into fat, uh, which Daniel has just explained is not helpful. And um, raised insulin is also linked to an increase in the hormone IGF-1, which stimulates cancer growth. And a high sugar intake also leads to increased inflammation in the body. And sugars also encourage the growth of bad bacteria or um, yeast in the gut, um, which when we get into to webinar three, we'll learn more about. So what exactly are refined carbohydrates? These are um, all sugars and um, foods that are made from carbohydrates, which um, are no longer whole grains. So they've been processed and, um, and refined uh, into things, you know, like flour, for instance, which is used to make bread and biscuits and cakes. Um, things like white rice is processed or even white potatoes is fast release. We don't want any soft drinks, both regular and diet. We want to take out the diet alcohol and um, we want to take out processed foods, anything, um, anything else with simple carbohydrates. The foods that we want to include in our eating are the more slow release carbohydrates, more whole grains, because these foods take longer for the stomach to, um, to break them down. So they don't cause the sugar spike and hence the insulin spike. So um, what we can include in small amounts is things like sweet potato or quinoa or brown rice, jumbo oats um, or oat bran. Next slide, please. The there are other ways of reducing insulin levels as well. And uh, things like going for a 15 minute brisk walk after eating has been shown to help keep glucose levels down and hence um, reduce insulin levels. And uh, another tip is to, when you dish up your food, to eat your protein and your fats and your vegetables first, and then to have your small portion of um, your whole grain carbohydrate has been shown to be helpful. There are some supplements as well, which can help um, control blood sugars. And these would be uh, berberine or chromium or cinnamon uh, is helpful with blood sugar regulation. And cinnamon can be taken as a spice with, um, you know, on your porridge in the morning or in a smoothie in the day, cinnamon is, is helpful to add to your, to your foods. And then calorie restriction or intermittent fasting has also been shown to reduce uh, insulin levels. Next slide, please. Another helpful approach for which there is evidence uh, is thought to be intermittent fasting. And what this involves is uh, fasting for at least 12 hours overnight with uh, three hours after dinner and before going to bed. Um, during this fasting time, you can drink uh, water and tea and coffee without milk or sugar, so no calories would be allowed in this time, um, and it is best to break the fast with uh, warm water, with lemon or with ginger, or maybe a green tea or another detoxifying drink. Next slide, please. 
So prostate cancer is different to many other cancers, which mostly feed off glucose. Um, prostate cancer cells actually tend to rely on fats for their energy and also on glutamine, which is a protein. It's only in the very late stages of prostate cancer, after it's been through many mutations, that prostate cancer actually becomes reliant on glucose as a fuel source. Next slide, please. So cancer cells increase the receptors for LDL cholesterol. This is the so-called bad cholesterol, allowing them to acquire more circulating LDL cholesterol from the bloodstream. All cancer cells increase fat metabolism, allowing them to make more cell membranes. Um, so blocking these pathways means that the cancer cells will struggle to make new cell membranes and you can markedly slow growth. Next slide, please. There are some uh, LDL lowering agents such as statins and nutraceuticals, which may be helpful. Um, and there are some of these nutraceuticals, things like berberine or resveratrol, which you might have heard from, uh, sort of comes from red grapes or red wine, um, red yeast rice, uh, nice, and EGCG, which is the phytonutrient in green tea. So these are, these are some of the uh, supplements which may be helpful, but it is important to discuss this with your practitioner before starting, as you just want to make sure that there's no drug nutrient interactions. And a lowering dietary intake of animal fat or saturated fat is important uh, with treatment of prost prostate cancer. Um, and a higher total fat intake has been associated with enhanced tumor progression. Next slide, please. So as we go through this section of the Mediterranean diet, it would be great if you could start thinking about some changes that you would be able to uh, that you'd be able and willing to uh, start making to your eating. This Mediterranean diet would be the core diet that you would be striving to achieve. The Mediterranean diet has long been shown to be beneficial in prevention and treatment of cancer. You can see from the pyramid that the Mediterranean diet is made up of largely whole foods. Uh, if you're looking at the bottom, the second bottom tier, you'll see it's largely made up of whole foods, plant-based diet, with majority of your making up the majority of your dietary intake, and then moving up to include some seafood and smaller amounts of meat, dairy, and eggs, with very minimal sugars uh, and refined or processed foods. What is interesting with the Mediterranean diet is the very bottom tier includes many lifestyle factors that are considered to be important alongside this way of eating. Being physically active and enjoying meals with others is part of this. There is an emphasis on physical activity, which has been shown to have multiple benefits in men diagnosed with all stages of prostate cancer, from strengthening bones to improving body physique and to enhancing overall well-being. Next slide, please. Eating meals with others is all part of the importance of eating in a relaxed environment. Stress massively affects digestion and takes the blood supply away from the gut, which affects the way that our digestion happens. If your foods are not digested properly, then you will not be getting good breakdown of the foods and the nutrients will not be available for absorption. Enzyme production is also affected. So it is possible that you could be eating the best organic, whole foods, plant-based diet, but you could perhaps not be getting the benefits from the nutrients if you are not breaking the food down properly. So this is why mindfulness around mealtimes is so important. You want to be able to connect with your food and to be engaged in the eating process. If you are excited about eating all the colorful, tasty food on your plate, then your body responds by secreting the necessary enzymes. If you have no connection to your meal, if you perhaps just drop, uh, pop something into the microwave or you're sitting in front of a TV or a laptop to eat, there's no, there's no connection with that food and digestion will be poor your body would not be engaged in this meal and the necessary digestive processes would be compromised. 
So eating in a relaxed environment is important, away from screens and other distractions. Focusing on the color, the flavor, the variety of foods on your plate, eating slowly and chewing your food well, this all helps with improved digestion. Next slide, please. So to adopt this way of eating, there are a few things that we need to pay attention to. One is, is we want to reduce uh, consumption of fats from animal origin. So reducing or removing red meat and dairy foods. We want to increase our consumption of vegetables and salads and have some fruit coming in. Legumes and other low GI whole grain foods in small amounts with meals. Moderate to high consumption of fish. Healthy fats in moderation, example, olive oil, olives, avocado, nuts and seeds. Low consumption of meat and meat products. We want to include some soy foods. And if there's any alcohol coming in, then small amounts of red wine. But I must, it must be said that it is advised to avoid alcohol until your cancer is under control. And then if drinking alcohol, it is best to have red wine in moderation and with a meal. Having wine with a meal influences the way it is metabolized and may have, important, uh, may have an important impact on the health risk of drinking uh, wine compared to consuming wine um, on an empty stomach. Um, next slide, thank you. So antioxidants and phytonutrients are really an important part of your intake as well. These are molecules that are found inside plant foods and they have many health benefits. We should be aiming to have half a plate of color at lunch and at dinner. So vegetables and salads would make up the majority of our diet. Fruit is also important, but to keep it down to two to three servings a day, spread evenly through the day, because there is more sugar inside fruit. So we don't want a concentrated amount coming in at any one time. Hence eating whole fruit is better than having fruit juices or dried fruits, which are more concentrated. Preferably organic, because from with the previous slide that Daniela went through, um, we know that non-organic plants contain um, more chemicals such as pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, which we know contribute to cancer. So eating organic does help lower our toxic burden. And we want to include a combination of uncooked and cooked um, plant foods. Um, I will say here that that's the best way to cook your vegetables is really by steaming. Um, you don't want to be boiling or microwaving because you'll be, use, you'll be losing more nutrition that way. And having some of your uh, vegetables in an uncooked form, for instance, like coleslaw is great. So trying to have a combination is good and trying to include as many colors as possible. You will see on the right, I have like a rainbow chart and um, this uh, is, a, uh, is a diet sheet which we can circulate to those that are interested. But what you're aiming for on this, on this diet sheet is to try and eat two different foods from each color group every day. So there are seven different color groups here. So you're aiming for up to 14 a day. But when you look at what's on this list, you'll notice that things like ginger and garlic and onion and herbs are all on here. So it doesn't mean having huge portions of anything. It's more about eating small amounts of a lot of different things each day. Next slide, please. There are many studies supporting the importance of fruit and vegetable consumption and prevention and treatment of cancer. And this study shows that eating seven portions of fruit and vegetables a day lowered the risk of death by 25% in cancer patients. Next slide, please. So when selecting carbohydrate foods, we want to select whole grains as these are grains that are grown by nature and are not processed. So they include all the different parts. They include the germ, the endosperm and the bran layers. And when you look at this picture on this slide, you'll be able to see all the different nutritional components that are found inside a whole grain. 
when that grain is processed and the outer layers are all stripped away, very little nutrition remains inside that grain. So um, it also makes it fast release uh, and, and breaks down much quicker in your stomach when all that fiber and the bran layers are removed. So we really are focusing our attention on eating whole grain foods. And these examples at the bottom of the sheet, you'll see things like jumbo oats or oat bran, heavy seeded breads, legumes, buckwheat, quinoa, sweet potatoes, brown rice, are all um, whole grain foods. Next slide, please. This is just an example of um, understanding labels. And when you are selecting your foods, it's really helpful to read labels um, because you can see which products contain whole grains. This is looking at the comparison between a organic or doesn't have yet, this is organic and um, jumbo oats as opposed to a super fast cook oats. And when you actually read the ingredients label, you'll notice on the or, um, jumbo oats that it says whole grain rolled oats. So you know the whole grain has been used in that product. What happens then is the whole grain becomes uh, processed and the um, particle size is made smaller. And that's why it becomes fast cook or quick cook is because the particle size is smaller and the fiber layers have been taken away. So when you read the ingredients on this fast cook one, you'll see it just says oat flakes. It says nothing about whole grain. And um, so the reason why it's quick cook, yes, as I said, is because the particle size is smaller. But if you think about it, this also means that it'll be broken down much quicker inside your stomach because it's a smaller particle and it's all gonna be dumped into your bloodstream at once, pushing your blood sugars up and causing that insulin spike, which we're trying to avoid. So really important to always try and go for whole grain options. Next slide, please. So whole grains also contain fiber, which is essential for your health. And um, one important detoxification route is through your gut by the elimination of stool. And by having a high fiber diet, this makes sure that you are eliminating um, properly through your gut and that you're going to the toilet regularly. So um, the importance, uh, fiber is important for cancer prevention for, for many reasons, but one is because it helps increase the transit time of fecal material. Um, this means what transit time is, is the time that it takes from the time that you eat the food to the time that it passes through um, the other way. So transit time should be between 12 and 48 hours. And um, for someone that is constipated or doesn't go to the toilet regularly, it means Means that the stool is hanging around in the colon for much longer and this enables any carcinogens or um, hormones or you know things that we're trying to get rid of it's um, it means that that there's more opportunity for them to be reabsorbed through the colon wall and background into circulation so really important that we're keeping things moving through our gut and um, the other thing about fiber is it binds uh, carcinogens and cancer forming molecules and gets rid of them in the stool. It also catches excess estrogens and hormones that we don't need and takes them out in the stool. And it also feeds the microbiome, which is the bacteria in our gut, um, enabling uh, them to produce short chain fatty acids, which are really important for keeping our gut healthy. So we're aiming for 20 to 25 percent, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 grams of fiber a day. Everything that we eat has got um, a fiber listed on the label, a fiber content. So it's possible to uh, pick up products and compare them. For instance, if you're picking up um, a soup and you'll be able to see that, you know, uh, say a lentil and vegetable soup has got a much higher fiber content than a chicken soup. So always trying to go for foods that have got a higher fiber content is good. Uh, next slide, please. And with regards to protein, we are wanting to try and increase our omega-3 intake through eating more oily fish. Uh, SMASH is a great acronym. These are good fish to be eating more of. And we've got uh, SMASH, which stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovy, sardines, and herring. These are higher in omega-3, uh, which is helpful for reducing inflammation um, and should be a, a, a good part of our eating. Uh, beans and lentils pulses are also an excellent protein source because they have no saturated fat, uh, very little fat altogether inside them, and they're very high in, pro in uh, fiber, so a great um, addition to the diet. 
and uh, we, sh we should be eating organic or pastured uh, sort of poultry, um, pastured uh, poultry. So we're looking at grass fed or herd fed chicken, which is um, you can get from certain butchers or farms uh, that you can order your meat from. Um, avoiding grain fed uh, poultry is what we're wanting to do here. Uh, and or going for, uh, for organic or omega-3 enriched eggs. And um, if you're eating any red meat, then it should be grass fed as well. Just to say that any grain fed meat is um, generally much higher in omega-6, which is more inflammatory. So we, we prefer the grass fed route and, um, and preferably organic as well. And then it, we should be avoiding dairy. But if you are having some dairy, then try and go for um, low fat uh, organic where possible. Next slide, please. There's... Um, a lot of uh, interesting research has come out on the benefits of soy um, with prostate cancer. And yes, it's been suggested that two servings of soy a day can inhibit spread of cancer in patients. It can lessen radiation side effects and it can slow the rise in PSA. Soy is also very helpful for reducing hot flushes and just two servings of soy a day has been shown to decrease the frequency of hot flushes by 50% and the severity by 54%. And soy has also been shown to be helpful for cognitive health, improving brain function and enhancing short-term memory. Next slide, please. This is a table which helps us to understand what a serving of soy might look like. One, por one portion of soy food would equate to having 6.25 grams of soy protein. So um, in this table, you can see on the right hand side, the grams of soy protein um, per serving. And it's not difficult to bring in two servings of soy a day. If um, we're trying to remove dairy from the diet, then soy milk is a great substitute for that. Um, using edamame beans, uh, maybe in some salads, uh, would be a good addition to your eating. Um, or maybe some Alpro soy yogurt could be, um, could be an addition to your eating as well. So there are some, you know, there's lots of things here to choose from um, in terms of trying to bring soy into your eating. Next slide, please. There are certain things that we want to avoid um, generally for uh, helping with, with prostate cancer. So we've spoken a lot about um, avoiding animal fats or reducing uh, red meat really in, in, um, uh, in the overall diet. And um, smoking and processed salt curing of meat and fish we want to avoid. That's also very carcinogenic. So uh, here we're thinking about things like um, bacon and ham and salami and smoked salmon. Um, all uh, processed meat should be uh, taken out the diet. Um, the guidelines really are less than 100 grams a, a week of processed meats. So um, yeah, I think many people exceed that. Dairy foods we want to try and avoid. We want to try and reduce burnt or barbecued um, or overcooked uh, foods or meats and all sugars and refined carbohydrates um, and limiting alcohol. Uh, yeah, these are, these are good things to think about changing in your eating. So just a, um, a few questions here is thinking about what your current dietary habits might look like. And um, what do you think you could change now? Um, it's worth maybe thinking about two things that you could think about changing straight away. Uh, things that I've been flagging, you know, chatting about now, going through the Mediterranean diet. Um, it might be as simple as adding in soy foods or um, trying to eat more oily fish in the week. So yeah, I think it's, um, it's worth just thinking about the changes that you might find easy to, to make straight away. Okay, next slide, please. So um, we would like to have a, a just focus a, a few minutes on uh, the ketogenic diets. These are very popular diets right now. You may have heard of them, um, but it's important to remember that whilst uh, the ketogenic diet uh, may be helpful, it's not a panacea diet and it's not suitable for everyone and not for every stage of cancer. And particularly in prostate cancer, um, the uh, there are, um, there's uh, varying data, but it seems to point in the direction 
um, of it being more uh, beneficial in the later stages of prostate cancer rather than the earlier stages. That said, um, what are ketogenic diets? Um, basically, they're based on a very low intake of carbohydrates, that's to say sugars, and a very high intake of good fats, um, uh, and alongside some moderate amounts of protein. Why is that? In these conditions, uh, when, um, when you're having a diet, a, a ketogenic diet, the liver starts to produce a fuel source uh, called ketones. Um, the ketogenic diet uh, reduces the circulating blood glucose level, so um, sugar levels are lower, and that means in turn that levels of insulin and of insulin growth factor one, which we have learned are high in cancers and including prostate cancer, um, that is reduced. And so by, uh, with a ketogenic diet, there is uh, a reduction in cell proliferation. Cancer cells can't use ketones, which is what is generated by a ketogenic diet. They can't use it for energy, but healthy cells can. So with a ketogenic diet, what you're doing is you are promoting the growth of healthy, cell, healthy cells and inhibiting to some degree the growth of cancer cells. Um, though not all cancers respond to ketogenic diets, um, it has been um, shown in from various uh, uh, research that there are no serious adverse events or toxicity related to the ketogenic diet, and therefore it, uh, it is thought to be a safe intervention. Next slide, please. So um, how do they work? Um, I've mentioned a bit about it already, but essentially healthy prostate tissue depends on burning uh, sugar to make energy. However, cancerous prostate tissue, particularly in the early stages, tends to make energy not from the breakdown of sugar, but from a process called oxidative phosphorylation and from fat. So early on, we're really focusing very much on that Mediterranean diet and on uh, reducing harmful fats. But in the later stages of prostate cancer, uh, the cancer can change its fuel source to become more reliant on glucose. And it's at this point, perhaps, that a, a ketogenic diet may be beneficial. So this is something to be discussed with your practitioner. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that you um, attempt a ketogenic diet without support, um, whereas the Mediterranean diet um, is probably a little bit more um, accessible in that sense. But certainly, a ketogenic diet needs some guidance. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we promote ketosis? Well, it is all about removing um, carbohydrates from the diet, limiting proteins, uh, increasing good fats, uh, regular exercise is important to um, keep our glucose levels down, and primarily a, a plant-based diet with lots of vegetables um, and salads and a little bit of fruit. And overnight fasting for at least 12 hours um, is helpful in getting into ketosis. With the ketogenic diet, the fats make up about 60% of the total uh, calorie intake. So um, this is a, a large percentage and uh, the meals would include lots of avocados and nuts and seeds and olive oil and sometimes MCT oils. And um, it is specialized in that um, you'd be perhaps using granolas that are made from nuts and seeds and coconut and coconut oil, having things like nut hummus instead of regular hummus, uh, stuffed avocados as snacks or mixed nuts as snacks, um, almond flowers and breads, uh, olives and things like guacamole are a very much part of a ketogenic diet. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. And I've actually just gone through that one. So on to the next one. Yeah. So um, protein, when it comes to the meat part of the ketogenic diet, meat is really just a condiment. It's not the main course. And um, you, you not, you, you're aiming to have um, not more than one gram of protein per kg body weight. So this really equates to uh, uh, the um, equivalent of about one to two eggs at breakfast, 90 grams, which is three ounces of meat at lunch, and um, sort of three to four ounces or 90 to 120 grams of fish or chicken. 
chicken at dinner. The quality of protein is really important here as well, looking at uh, keeping up the same values that I spoke about earlier with pastured or organic chicken um, or grass fed beef, because uh, they have a better um, omega-3 uh, to omega-6 ratio, which is um, more anti-inflammatory. Uh, eggs should be from pastured chickens and not factory raised and wild caught, not farmed fish. And um, we want to favor the smash fish again, which is the salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Next slide, please. So this is the what a, what a typical day on a ketogenic uh, diet would look like. Nice and colorful, um, lots of salad and vegetables coming in. You can see the avocados and the um, olive oil dressings um, and the picture of the coconut yogurt with um, that's got uh, some uh, flaked almonds and some blueberries on there as a snack. So yes, a very, very colorful diet, but um, largely, largely made up of the vegetables and the salads with some protein uh, coming in there as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. So really the, um, the common denominators between the Mediterranean diet and the ketogenic diet, uh, there's quite a lot that, that runs across um, both diets, which we uh, want to highlight here, because these are, these are important for, for all of us to be doing. And this would be, again, focusing on organic, um, plant-based, antioxidant rich anti-inflammatory whole foods diet. So nice and colorful uh, diet with a low consumption of, um, of sort of red meat and dairy, a high consumption, as I said, of vegetables and salads, um, limited fruit. So a couple of fruits spread over the day and um, lots of fish coming in, preferably oily fish and wild caught, healthy fats coming in with olive oil, olives, avocados, nuts and seeds, and um, some soy food uh, included in there and avoiding alcohol and sugar on the whole. Next slide, please. There are some really specific foods to include um, uh, on a regular basis with prostate cancer. These are foods that um, have been shown to have a positive effect. So I'm sure many of you have heard of lycopene, which is a fatter nutrient um, found inside tomatoes and uh, to a lesser degree in watermelon and pink grapefruit. But lycopene is a um, fat soluble um, molecule. So it's absorbed better when tomatoes are cooked with a little bit of olive oil. So thinking about having um, more cooked tomatoes inside your diet or um, things like uh, tomato soups or even tinned tomatoes and various meals is, uh, is a good option. Um, and lycopene has been shown to inhibit the growth and the spread of prostate cancer. Cruciferous vegetables are all your bitter tasting vegetables. So things like broccoli, cauliflower, radishes, cabbage, um, watercresses on here. There's many different cruciferous vegetables, which I'll definitely be going into uh, in talk three. And these are associated with a lower risk of developing aggressive prostate cancer and also associated with lower risk of recurrence. So it's recommended to have a half a cup uh, every day of one of these vegetables. Soy we've spoken about, which is protective against prostate cancer and green tea polyphenols, um, significant protective effects. Uh, the, um, the trick with green tea is that it needs to be brewed for at least five minutes for the active molecules to come out into the water. And the more green tea you have, the better um, sort of benefit you get from it. So it's recommended to have between four and six cups a day. And having decaffeinated green tea is just as good. So if you're sensitive to caffeine, then it would be fine to use the decaf versions of that. And it might be that you uh, make a teapot in the morning and just let it brew and just um, drink on that uh, you know, during the day. Uh, it's a good habit to get into. And then pomegranate um, has got many polyphenolic compounds uh, which inhibit the proliferation of prostate cancer cells. And um, it's been shown in studies that taking uh, sort of 240 mils of, of pomegranate juice daily for up to 33 months, that their PSA doubling time 
rose from an average of 15 months to an average of 54 months. So some really promising uh, research on um, pomegranate, but of course, with it being a fruit and containing um, probably con well, concentrated uh, sort of sugars, it's probably best maybe to take a supplement for the, um, for the pomegranate. So next slide, please. So we're going to be talking about some uh, useful supplements. Um, there may be some questions on this um, as well. I've put together three slides um, uh, with uh, uh, a list of supplements that are most commonly found in the literature in support of their use um, in and around prostate cancer. Um, uh, the first thing to be said here is that um, we always, uh, next slide please, we always um, uh, recommend food first. Okay, so we want uh, you to get your the majority of your nutrients from food. However, there may be circumstances in, in which you might want to supplement um, with some of these um, uh, active ingredients, um, either because of um, the si particular situation that you may find yourself in, uh, in terms of your um, disease progression, or uh, for example, you know, there may be some issues around absorption and we will be talking obviously about gut health um, in the third talk in, in, in greater detail. But there, so there may be a, a series of circumstances in which you might want to supplement. And the list that I present here, um, again, not intended to be substitute for pharmacological therapy or any other therapy, but certainly an, an adjunct. And um, the suggested doses that I mentioned here, uh, again, should be used as guidance. Uh, this is uh, because um, the um, information comes from a, a wide range of different uh, data sets, uh, different studies, um, some are uh, lab studies in vitro, some are in animal studies, and, and there are also clinical trials in humans. So uh, there's, a, there's a wide variety of different types of um, um, information. However, uh, when you break it down, you see that, that some of them are, are, are um, gain greater traction. Um, for example, on this first slide, you'll see uh, lycopene, uh, which uh, Linda has just um, mentioned. And um, uh, studies have shown that there is a significant linear dose response for dietary lycopene and prostate cancer risk, such that prostate cancer is decreased by 1% for every additional two milligrams of lycopene consumed. So there, there, there is certainly very strong evidence for that. It's a very good antioxidant, it prevents DNA damage and so forth. I don't propose to go through every single one of these. Uh, I'll leave you to have a look at them. But um, essentially, um, uh, there, there, there is benefit in certain scenarios um, for taking them. The ones that I would probably pick as my sort of top few is sometimes a bit difficult, but I certainly would say lycopene, zinc, because of its, its effect on balancing hormones, um, green tea, as, as uh, Linda has mentioned, um, uh, soy isoflavones, but also, uh, as in the next slide, um, you'll see vitamin D, omega-3, uh, pomegranate, which um, Linda's just mentioned. Um, curcumin. Curcumin uh, is, a, is a fabulous all-rounder. Um, it's an anti-inflammatory, but it's probably a modulator of many different functions in the, in the body. We, we see it when, uh, um, its benefits, we see its benefits and we see data supporting uh, its benefits uh, across a wide range of conditions, cancer included. So I, you know, if, if you have to choose, probably that would be one of the top uh, choices. Next slide, please. Yes, and uh, carrying on, um, reishi mushrooms there um, um, are mentioned because of their um, beneficial effect on uh, you know, the immune system, which we'll also be talking about later on. And some of the other ones at the bottom of this list, such as resveratrol, sulforaphane, as res resveratrol, we've mentioned it before, uh, related to, um, you find it in red wine and grapes and so forth, and sulforaphane um, from um, cruciferous vegetables. Okay, next slide, please. So the next uh, thing we're going to talk about is the lifestyle factors, uh, only touching on them today. So we know that um, uh, there, there is a research and data supporting the um, role of exercise, 
the avoidance of toxins, uh, definitely sleep hygiene, um, good sleep routines. This is a time, you know, when you're sleeping, this is a time when you repair. Um, management of stress for all sorts of reasons, including hormonal regulation, including uh, better digestion, and also for its effects on emotional well-being, which is also extremely important. So we'll be talking about that in greater detail um, in, the, in the last webinar. Next slide, please. So, um, as I said, we will be talking about gut health in detail in the third webinar, but I do want to mention here, because it's so important, that gut health and, uh, has been shown to be uh, linked in research to all of these things, your nutritional status, your energy levels, your levels of immunity, uh, how inflamed you may or may not be. It's definitely related to brain health. There's a definite brain, uh, sort of gut brain connection. Uh, gut health is uh, crucial to uh, good levels of detoxification to help your body get rid of all its toxins. And it's also heavily involved in hormonal balance. All of these things are um, related and play a role in the way the body develops and then fights cancer. So it's, it's of vital importance to, uh, uh, to take care of our gut health and uh, we'll be explaining how to do that. Um, so I think we are moving on to the poll. Linda, over to you. David, on to you. <laughs> we're going to do a post. Uh, this is the post poll. We did the pre poll to see how you were um, doing before. And hopefully, as we've talked you through um, this uh, webinar, um, some of those things may have changed. So please take a, a minute to go through the second poll and tell us how many different types of fruit and vegetables you can commit to eating every day. And, uh, and you'll see the other, I can't see all of the, the questions on the poll, but um, I'm sure you can read them. All right, we'll just keep this open for 15 seconds more conscious. We are running a few minutes behind schedule and, and I've already got a, a long list of questions that um, have, have come in and I want to make sure we really maximize the time for that. So I'm closing this poll in five, four, three, two, one. So thank you everyone who's shared that. I'll, I'll just quickly run through just so you know where we've got a lot of people committing to, um, you know, in increase the number of fruit and veg every day, which is great. Obviously, um, you know, your, your words have, have, have got through. Um, and we've got a lot of people saying also, uh, over half saying they're going to add oily fish um, to regularly to their meal. Um, many people already do, which is great. Um, you know, similarly about half, uh, again, have said they're going to start adding pulses, legumes, whole grain foods um, and soil foods into um, into their meals. I think actually perhaps most surprisingly of all these is that soya um, is probably the one that most people are saying they're going to add that they don't already do. We've got far fewer um, people are saying they already have um, soya regularly in their diet. So I think that's probably the big the big takeaway from, from, from looking at this today. And a really great commitment of people saying they're going to reduce some of those nastier um, things that you mentioned, the sort of the particularly refined carbs and sugar, um, dairy and red meat. So thank you everyone for, uh, for completing those. Okay, great. So we thought we'd put together um, just three top tips from um, 
from today just for you to take away. Uh, there's been so much that we've spoken about and um, I hope that your minds aren't all spinning. But three things that we, that we would like you to, uh, yeah, just to, to try and remember. And the first thing really is around mindfulness um, when eating your food and to try and eat slowly and to chew your food well in a relaxed environment. I might just say here that the, um, that the research tells us that we should be chewing our food 30 times each mouthful. And uh, it only, um, you know, it's only when you start thinking about that uh, when you're eating, you realize how difficult it really is to do. So um, it's a constant reminding um, and just trying to improve on your digestion. The second thing is to try and follow the Mediterranean diet with small portions of whole grain foods um, in your meals, reducing dairy and meat intake, trying to eat a rainbow of colors um, at each meal and including more good fats um, in your eating as well. And then lastly, really the importance of aiming for a healthy weight. So these, um, yeah, these were just three things that we, that we wanted to remind you of. Next slide, please. So just a reminder of what we'll be covering next week. Um, we'll be looking at the nutritional support whilst undergoing treatment and looking at the side effects of treatment and how uh, we can support you through that. Um, looking at the principles of detoxification and then also um, discussing some useful supplements to help the side effects of treatment um, as well. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our talk. We, are, um, we hope that you found that useful and we're ready to take on some questions. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Thank you both very much for that really, uh, really great talk. Um, and yeah, we've got some questions coming. Um, so let, let me start from the top and see what we can get through. Um, the first question was really, um, uh, you mentioned about avoiding dairy. Um, but well, one, one gentleman has said that um, with hormone therapy, um, they're advised that they need some dairy to get calcium to keep bones strong. So, so you know, how, how do you sort of square that circle? Do you have any recommendations around what, um, what should be done in these situations? Yes, so um, it's a great question. I think um, we're always making sure that our patients that are removing dairy from the diet, that they're replacing them with milk alternatives that contain calcium to the same level as dairy. So really important when you are selecting soy milk or um, you know oat milk or whatever other dairy, um, dairy alternative, if you check the labels, you will see that they have got calcium added to them. Um, some of them don't, some of them do. So when you read those labels, on the boxes just make sure that the calcium it will be about 120 milligrams of calcium per 100 mils of the milk so that's absolutely key that you replace with a fortified um, sort of milk alternative and then in the third session we'll be looking more at bone health as well so we'll be talking more about um, the importance of all the other minerals that are needed for absorption of calcium and it's not really it's not only about calcium and vitamin d it's, there's a lot more that's needed for healthy bones so we will be touching on that and what about canned oily fish? Is that That's any absolutely fine? Yeah. Um, how about if you don't like fish? Is there a substitute? So um, if you don't eat any fish, it's probably best to go into an omega-3 supplement to get the levels of um, omega-3 that you're needing. You can get omega-3 in some other food sources like flaxseed, ground flaxseed is really a good fiber source. You can add that to your um, porridge in the morning um, or, you know, I think that's the easiest place to smoothies. It can be added in the day. Uh, you can also get some omega-3 in walnuts are, are a good source and chia seeds, but not to the same level as oily fish so if oily fish is not part of your diet it's probably best to supplement and what about processed food with soya like corn is that helpful or is that detrimental um so i would it is processed um it's still got some soy, yeah, it, is, it still have the, the phytoestrogens that are useful, but I think as part of a varied diet, it would be okay to include some of that. Um, I just wouldn't be eating that every day. I think it needs to be part of a balanced diet, yeah. And is soy sauce included in recommended soya? No, there's not enough of the active ingredient in soy sauce. Um, how about kefir? Is that a useful um, uh, 
type of food ingredients. <laughs> it is. In fact, um, kefir is obviously beneficial because it's got all the um, the probiotics in it, the bacteria, which are useful for your gut. You can get coconut kefir and you can get water-based um, uh, kefir, so it doesn't have to be dairy-based. But if you're going to be including any dairy in your diet, then it's good that it's got some benefits. So having milk-based kefir would be one of the better things to include rather than having too much cheese or uh, dairy products that are high in your saturated fats, which we really want to try and eliminate. So um, yeah, it's a good food. What do you distinguish between sort of white and whole bread as well as whole grain or this? Most of your, um, most of your breads on the shelf are processed. You really want to, if you are eating some bread, it should be heavy breads. So you're looking at really seeded, grained, heavy breads are what you're going for. Um, there's rye breads and pumpernickel breads and those really um, almost hard breads to eat are the ones that you're wanting to go for. So white, brown, granary bread, they're all fast release. It's got to be more than that. There's breads like Vogel's bread and um, the Bergen breads are slow release, so they are okay. But you really want to go for heavy breads. That's your key, where they're really dense and you can see the whole grains inside the bread, not only on the top. And what about sourdough? Throw that into the mix when it comes to breads. So um, sourdough, obviously not sourdough white bread, you want to be going for a sourdough seeded bread. Um, so again, you can get heavy sourdough breads, which is perfect. The benefit of sourdough is that there's less gluten in the bread. So for patients that struggle with bloating or um, any gut symptoms, it's generally better tolerated. So it would depend again on what flours are used in the sourdough bread. And in, in terms of pommy tea, um... Is this, is this a good, easy supplement that you'd recommend? Say that again, David, in terms of? Is pommy tea um, a good, easy supplement that you would recommend? Daniela, do you know? I don't. Is it, do we mean tea as in the drink or just, is that a brand name or a pommy it's, brand? It's a brand name. It's, um, I, I, I'll dare to step in here. I believe it's um, developed by Professor Rob Thomas, um, who's is quite well known. Um, prostate cancer oncologist and, and I've, I've heard many good things about it um, you know I'm, I'm not going to step in and answer that um, on your behalf but um, I've, I've heard many good things from others um, in, in the in the this this world the pommy tea is is a good supplement and, and seems to contain the things you've been talking about today yeah. there uh, you go. So it's obviously got the pomegranate extracts in it yeah um, uh, what about the mercury content in oily fish? Is that is that an issue if you're going to be uh, consuming oily fish four four times a week or more? Yes, that's um, that's really why we're going for um, sort of not the big for big fish. So we're wanting to um, not eat too much tuna, which we know is higher in mercury and the bigger fish. The ones that go with the SMASH acronym are generally the ones that are lower in mercury. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, do, we are very aware of mercury um, and we do need to be careful out there. But generally, the smaller fish are the safer ones to be eating. And what about um, I have a question around sort of the, the cost of, of you know, some of these foods, um, particularly for um, you know, people on, on um, you know, pe pensions? Um, you know, are there any sort of ways you can advise that um, people can still eat in the ways you're sort of recommending? Always a difficult question. I think um, in the third talk, we'll be focusing more on um, which foods really should be organic and which ones you can get away with not being organic. So that's um, one thing that we'll go into in the third talk. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's tough. I guess meat is, 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 part, is quite an expensive part of the diet. So if you're reducing intake of, um, of animal sort of meat and that hopefully you'll be saving money and can eat sort of more of the pulses and the legumes which are more affordable um, and then getting the balance right between the vegetables and the fruit and, and really purchasing the ones that are um, really needed to be in the organic range because they've got more chemicals on and then there's also a safe range which have got less chemicals on during growth so those ones would be fine to buy non-organic um, yeah, I don't know, Daniel, if there's anything else that you yeah, want to add. That sums it up, really, that we do have a list we can circulate. We will, as Linda said, we will be talking about it more. There is a list of certain um, 
uh, vegetables that we think, fruit and vegetables that we think really ought to be organic where possible, whereas others, it's okay to have regular and um, not be overexposed to uh, nasties. Uh, we, have, we have one comment come in um, that pommy tea is recommended by the Christie Hospital. Um, so um, thank, you. Th thank you very much um, for, for sending that in. So it's a, a pretty good recommendation, we'd say that. Um, uh, there's one question around vitamin E, which has come in from, from a, a couple of different people. Um, uh, one gentleman said he was, he was told by his surgeon uh, to stay away from vitamin E after his uh, surgery. Um, and a, another um, that her husband was advised to take vitamin E supplements many years ago, but didn't advise him to stop taking them when diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, mm -hmm. Even though it, it says um, in some places that vitamin E supplements have been shown to increase the risk of prostate cancer and should be avoided. So yeah. well, maybe I'll, I'll, if I may, I'll answer that question. Um, the recommendations and the worry around the use of vitamin E and selenium came particularly from a, a study called the SELECT study. Um, but in that study, that, wh where it was shown to actually perhaps increase uh, prostate cancer, um, but they chose in that study to use um, a particular type of uh, vitamin E, a synthetic uh, um, tocopherol, it's called um, alpha, instead of using the whole range of vitamin E's, including the gamma, that is safer and more protective. And so um, perhaps that was the reason why the result was skewed towards showing um, a detrimental effect. And similarly with selenium, um, uh, using a particular type of selenium, the um, uh, selenomethionine is was actually the one that was used, but th that was possibly related to the to the adverse outcomes. Whereas when you use um, uh, um, selenized yeast, um, the the studies show that that's protective. So uh, it's it's uh, when it comes to supplements, uh, it's really important to know which types you're taking, and so um, a all round uh, vitamin E with um, it's called tocopherols that contains the whole range, including gamma, is thought to be safe. Um, so avoid synthetic um, alpha tocopherols, which were shown to be detrimental. And similarly with selenium, you want a, a selenized yeast as opposed to selenomethionine. Um, we have a, a question around uh, fiber gel, which uh, someone was pres prescribed twice during radiotherapy and, and a year later by their GP. Is, this, is it better to avoid sort of things like fiber gel and just really try and go for sort of a Mediterranean diet with high fiber in it? Uh, Shall I one step? Yeah, you go, Linda. Okay, so, um, well, actually it's most important to keep the bowel moving. So if the patient is constipated, we are absolutely, um, you know, not against using things like fiber gel or Movicol to get the bowels moving. And there will be periods during treatment where this is totally needed because, um, you know, the patient might not have a good appetite or a loss of appetite, which means they're not eating enough food. And so we sometimes need to be using um, agents like this. But in the end, we would be trying to come back to the Mediterranean diet, trying to to reach that 20 to 25 grams of fiber a day through the diet but there will always be periods of time during treatment as I say that the gut is affected in some way and you might need to be on a low fiber diet or you know various things so we'll go more into that in the next in the next talk. What about uh, red wines uh, sort of they equally good slash equally bad or you know do you tend to find ones that are you know more expensive or from particular parts of the world even um, any difference or natural or organic wines even? Well, I guess organics always got the benefit of no chemicals. So um, so that is uh, probably better. In terms of type of grape, they've all got resveratrol. So um, I don't think there's a huge difference between different brands or uh, different types of grape. I'm, I'm not 100% sure though, Daniela. I'm not sure if you know more. Being I, I don't know that there's any specific study around that. I don't know. Could I just intervene on something else that I just thought from a previous comment? Um, when... Um, when you're uh, choosing or not choosing to use supplements, um, remember that um, uh, dose is important. So uh, too much or too little may not may not be uh, reaching target. So uh, if you have to, you know if you choose even a good supplement, it doesn't uh, mean that taking a lot more is more beneficial. Or you, do you see? So it's it is uh, you have to be a bit careful with dosing. 
in terms of um, coffee, is there anything around and coffee? Um, I've heard a few questions on uh, you know, just, just, is coffee uh, sort of bad or good? So both, I mean, there's, there's some beneficial molecules inside coffee has got some antioxidants in, which, are, which is beneficial, so that's fine. But when patients are going through treatment with chemotherapy, particularly where appetite could be reduced, then we need to be careful of caffeine because it suppresses the appetite more. So um, it really depends on the patient's stage of treatment, when or if, um, you know, caffeine is fine. And of course, it can affect sleep, which Daniel has sort of touched on today being important. So if patients are sensitive to caffeine and they don't detoxify it well, then it's important that it's taken early stages of the day. So it's really different with um, every patient, but we don't have anything against coffee. Um, there's a, a question coming around eggs. A, a couple of people asked around eggs. Um, some people have been told that eggs were, were very bad for prostate cancer. Um, you know, is, is, is eating eggs too often a bad thing? Are there too many per day that's a bad thing? Um, are you able to advise on that? Yeah, there is some research out with eggs that the choline inside the egg yolk um, is potentially not good for prostate cancer. Um, I had, didn't go into that today. I didn't want to. Um, <laughs> I didn't really have time to expand on it. But I think that the that um, you know eggs can still be part of your diet, but perhaps limiting the egg yolks. So if you're making an omelet using one egg yolk and more of the egg whites is fine. Um, but I'd probably be a little bit cautious of eating egg yolks um, every day. Yeah. Um, we're, just to follow up on the on the um, question around vitamin E and selenium, it, is it possible to get the sort of recommendations for those types that are safe? Um, could we include that in the follow up email? Um, so I just wanted to. Sort of, uh, they are they are also mentioned on those three slides um, supplements. It does mention um, those. I'll, I'll just double check that it's got all of that information, but I I, I feel pretty sure that it that it does have it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we've just got a, three minutes left, so I'll just try and get a, a last few questions in. Do you know anything about um, the role of, this is very, it feels very topical, uh, CBD oil um, in the prevention and or treatment of prostate cancer? Um, not so much the prevention or treatment, but we do know that CBD oil in general has a, a lot of um, properties. It seems to help uh, with gut health. It seems to be supportive in, in, of immune health. Um, it can help with, in some cases, with pain management. Um, it's also um, probably um, uh, upregulating those receptors that are um, that are part of the wider what we call endocannabinoid system. This is an overarching uh, system that regulates hormones and neurotransmitters. So without going into super detail, I would say that CBD oil is probably safe to use. Uh, I don't know to what extent there is evidence of it preventing or uh, cancer, but it's probably a, a good um, a, a good one to try in certain circumstances. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, and what about uh, red grape juice? Uh, would you recommend that as uh, you know possibly a good alternative to to wine, or is that the problem you mentioned earlier with fruit juice, where you have just yeah, a very very high in sugar? So as much as it's got the resveratrol and the good properties, and we do need to be careful of the concentration of that coming in. So you know if you if you are going to be using something like that, I would say just small shots diluted with water with a meal rather than on its own. Um, but it might be best to take that resveratrol as a supplement. Um, yeah, I've probably said that's that might be safer. And then I think possibly one last question we have time for, or maybe a second one is: Do you have um, any thoughts around pumpkin seeds and saw pal palmetto, which have come in from a few different people um, on on you know, the benefits or not of these? The so saw palmetto is is uh, used quite a lot in prostate health. Um, uh, it has effects on. Um, uh, on the regulation uh, of uh, and metabolism of male hormones. And so it is generally used for that. I think it's uh, at um, uh, mm, regular doses, I think it would be completely um, okay. Um, I think there might, there might be some uh, individual specifics around the sort of level of prostate cancer, sort of the staging, and you know, whether we're trying to sort of suppress hormones or not. So th there may be individual cases, but I think in general terms, it's probably reasonably safe. And the- I think pumpkin seeds is all about the zinc content actually. So um, yeah. 
the same conversation. So zinc is a promoter of um, uh, testosterone, uh, uh, not only, I mean, it's involved in very many uh, processes in the body and many uh, enzymatic processes. Um, so we, I think it, it's, there is evidence around use of zinc, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in prostate cancer. So I think it's safe and probably in many cases beneficial. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think that's probably all we have time for today. I'm sorry um, to those of you who we didn't get to answer um, all of your questions, but um, don't worry, Daniela and Linda will be back with us next week um, for the second um, of, of these sessions. Um, so just like to say a big thank you um, from um, us at PCR for Daniel and Linda today for their time and, and for all of you for joining and uh, taking time out of your afternoon uh, to join this session.